Welcome to First Baptist Campus. We welcome you. Welcome to church. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Sunday School Fast at First Baptist Campus. Welcome to church. We're so glad you're here this morning. Come, be, be our, our friend. friend. You are very welcome, wanted, and desired. Welcome to church. The Queens love you! Good morning. We're so glad you're here. We're glad you came to join us for worship. Let's worship together. We invite you to come and be a part of our worship. Let's worship. Good morning. What a beautiful day God's given us to worship him. Amen. You know, God's word says in Psalms 13, 6, that Jesus has been good to me. If you agree with that, say amen. amen. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Father God, we speak the name of Jesus today to all those that are afflicted, to disease, Lord, to this pandemic, to cancer, Lord, because he is our great physician. Lord, we speak the name of Jesus to those that feel hopeless. For, Lord, you are our hope. Lord, we speak the name of Jesus to the enemy. And we ask that you bind him from this place today, for we are here to worship you. It's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Guys, stand with us and let's just sing. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Addiction starts to break, declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your, Your name, name is power. power. Your, Your name, name is healing. Your stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety to every soul held captive by over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus
name of Jesus over every heart and every mind cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus speak his name Jesus 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 Sing this with us. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus.
725 tells us about two guys. One built their house on the sand and one built their house on the rock. The rain came and the winds blew, but the guy who built his house on the rock, he was on solid ground. Rain came when blue, my house was built on you. I'm safe with you, I'm gonna make it through. Rain came with blue, my house was built on you. I'm safe with you, I'm gonna make it through. Again, rain came. Rain Let's pray. Lord, we come to you today just so thankful that you are that firm foundation, Lord, that we can build our life on, that we can put our faith and our trust in you each and every day, Lord. I just pray that as we continue to worship, Lord, that that you just open our hearts, that it's receptive to your message, Lord, and move in a mighty way today. I pray all this in your holy name. Amen.
Those who wait on the Lord don't go anywhere. They don't move forward. They don't turn back. They wait. Wait for God to answer. Wait for the Father to provide. Wait for the Avenger to act for the hurt to stop, for the door to open. But sometimes, in the waiting, in the stubborn trusting without seeing, we find an unexpected moment, and then another an unreasonable peace, a surprising joy, a shocking sense that the answer matters less than being loved by the one we're waiting for. And so we worship in the waiting, and we wait a little more. Take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 37. Psalm 37 is where we're going to be. And obviously you see the topic is waiting. Um, there's lots of things in our lives that we don't understand why they don't happen quicker. We're going through one of those in our home that we, we want everything to hurry up and get done so uh, Madison can get on with her life. But as you go throughout the Bible, God makes his people wait. For, at times. Uh, we know Joseph had to wait. We know Moses had to wait. Uh, Daniel had to wait. Paul had to wait. 
Uh, the disciples had to wait in the upper room uh, because they weren't ready for what the Lord was wanting them to do. And we don't like waiting. You know, the, the prayer, the American prayer is this, Lord, give me patience and I want it right now. Okay, hurry up and get this thing done in my life so I can move on. But it's during those waiting periods that um, we've been talking about what worship is. And worship is you encountering God. That's what worship is, you encountering God. And during those waiting times, uh, when we can't figure out what to do, when we can't figure out why it's going on, God is speaking to us. He's teaching us those moments in the valley. And in those waiting periods when he's silent, he's trying to get us to, to just settle down and listen. Listen for his voice. Listen for what he wants you to do. And we make mistakes sometimes because we don't want to wait, so we rush into something and we get in trouble because we didn't wait on God's perfect timing and perfect answer. We're waiting right now as uh, we're seeking someone to lead music here. And I appreciate everyone that's helped us out during this time. They put in so much hard work. Thank you for all that. It's very much appreciated by your pastor here and by the church, I know. So we're waiting, always waiting. We're waiting for our, our IRS returns here pretty soon. Uh, those are going to be coming in. But life is full of waiting, and we don't like it. The word wait is used 106 times in the Bible, and it's an absolutely irritating experience. Right now, we go to Vanderbilt every couple of weeks, and we have to wait. <laughs> we're like you know a bunch of cattle that get herded in. And I feel like an alien in this world right now because the mat, you go in there, everybody's masked up, everybody's gloved up, they got chairs, you know, eight feet apart, and you just move slowly when they tell you, and you sit and you don't talk. Nobody's talking. And Lord help you if you sneeze or cough because <laughs> you're instantly screamed at, there's a leper among us, there's a leper among us. You know, and people start, you know, pull out Lysol and start spraying everything, and they want you, you know, to, to leave the room quickly because they felt like they were contaminated. But waiting rooms are awful for several reasons, especially in the hospital. Um, you don't have any idea. We never know how long it's going to take before they take her back. Or if you've been there, I went to the ER a while back, for a kidney stone, and, and we waited and waited and waited to, to go through the, the process. So you don't know how long it's going to take. You have no control when you're in the waiting room. You're sitting there at their mercy. Um, uh, you can't see what's going on past the receptionist's window. A lot of times they, they close that window, and you can't see what's taking place. You know, are they back there playing cards? Are they back there working? Are they, are they just saying, let's see how long we can hold this person out here until... You know, they break. Uh, the, another thing is sometimes somebody comes in after you and they go in before you in the waiting room. I don't understand that. Then there's that weird music sometimes that they play in the waiting room. Or they'll have a TV there playing some drug company's, you know, advertisement. Um, it's just a strange place. But in life, God has to send us to a waiting place from time to time. That's part of his plan. And those are the times where we struggle and we don't understand it. We don't know what's going on or what he's doing. Um, others seem to be getting ahead of us, and so it's frustrating. But it's God's will for us to be here in that waiting period at that time. And in Psalm 37, uh, the, it talks about how to deal with the waiting place, how to deal with those times when you don't understand the purpose and the practice of waiting on God. I know it's frustrating. I'm right there with you. But God has a purpose in that. He has a purpose. Maybe he's protecting you in something. Maybe he's preparing you for something bigger. But um, anyway, if you take your Bibles, we're going to look at Psalm 37, and we're going to read the first seven verses, and then we'll pray. So if you'd stand, please. You love that word fret. I do. Do not fret because of evildoers. Be not envious toward wrongdoers, for they will wither quickly like the grass and fade like the green. Herb, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and cultivate faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will do it. He will bring forth your righteousness as light and your judgment as noonday, rest in the Lord and wait patiently on him. Do not fret 
because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Let's pray. Lord, help us not to fret. (laughs) Help us to understand those waiting periods in our life are part of your plan. We don't always know why, but you do. So help us to trust you. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. You know, also in Matthew 5, 5, this is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this. He says, blessed, and that's those that are happy or fortunate is what that word blessed means. Blessed are the gentle, which are the meek, because they will inherit the earth. So it goes together with Psalm 37 really good. And the problem with us when we're in the waiting room is we aren't in control. And that's why we get frustrated. We like to be in control. But it's a matter of pride and self-centeredness self-centeredness that uh, causes these things and a lot of mistakes are made in our lives with deep consequences because we don't wait for what God has for us to do and you know there's a story about Muhammad Ali who was flying on a plane first class and the stewardess was really pretty it was back when there weren't dudes that were stewardesses just women and he was flying on the plane and you know he's a character who always like to joke around and the stewardess is going through all the protocols, what you're to do, and she gets to the seat belts, and she's, you know, showing how to close the seat belts, and she notices that Muhammad Ali doesn't have one on. And so she walks up to him, and she says, sir, you need to put that seat belt on. He says, Superman don't need no seat belt. She looked at him, and she kind of smiled, and she says, Superman don't need a plane either. Put your seat belt on. We like to think that we can have things our way, don't we? And as Christians, we think we should get special privileges because we're serving the Lord. And sometimes it seems like this passage says that evil is overcoming the good and and we're, we're not getting the blessings that we think God ought to give us. And here's the thing that you ought to remember. This is the best it gets for people that don't know Jesus Christ. Okay, All this stuff fades. Uh, there's a funeral today for one of our church members, uh, Jeff Jones. Um, Jeff didn't take anything to heaven but his soul and his salvation. Okay, There's no U-Haul on the back of a hearse. You've heard that said before. So this is the best it gets for those people. So if you see somebody prospering that's doing evil right now, look away. We win in the end. Our rewards are on the other side. They've been FedEx, and it's stuff that other people can't harm or touch. The key is learning how to wait properly. And you're probably asking yourself, what does meekness and waiting have in common? A lot more than you think. Because meekness means to be humble. It means to be submissive to the will of God. And meekness is a word that was used a lot when we were in Texas about a horse. And the place where we first boarded our horses, they broke horses, and we got to watch the process of that. And basically with a horse, there's three things you can do with it. You can let it run wild, like the Mustangs out in Wyoming and Colorado and the different places, you can just let them run wild. Or you can corral it and lock it up. Doesn't have to be broke. You can just lock it up in a cage like at a zoo and people can, you know, look through the glass and and wave at it and that's about it. Or you can break it and tame it so its power can be used. You know, those horses are 1,500 pounds, 1,200 pounds, 1,500 pounds. And once you break a horse, that's power under control. It's meekness. That's what God wants us to do is understand the power that we have and then keep it under control. God's not going to let you run wild or me run wild. And you're no good to him if you can't serve. He wants you to be in that. So you've heard the old saying, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. And to be able to be in that category, you've got to be submissive. You've got to be meek. You've got to be willing to listen to what he has. And his desire is to fill you with his power and make our lives more meaningful and effective. And sometimes he's got to break you. He's got to put you in the waiting room so that you understand. You know, I think of the disciples, you know, when, when Jesus uh, had told them, go to the upper room and wait on me, okay? And I'll be there in a little bit. They're up there waiting, and they don't know what's getting ready to take place. That 3,000 people are going to be saved. But... They needed to be in that waiting place because otherwise their pride would have gotten them in trouble. Jesus knew that. So when he quotes the Old Testament passage here in Sermon on the Mount, the people instantly knew what he was talking about. 
they understood, you know, we have that beautiful passage in Isaiah that says, those that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run, run and not be weary. They shall not be weak and faint. You and I can't do anything but walk. <laughs> Some of us can run, not me. If you see me run and pull over and get me because somebody's chasing me. But for God to get us where we need to do, sometimes he often calls us to wait. And we've got to learn to do that with the right heart, with the right attitude, and have joy, knowing that he's working. He's still working. You know, we, we see all this madness in our world right now, and we go, why doesn't he come back? I say this all the time. Come on back. Let's go. Wrap this thing up. Blow the horn. Let's get out of here because this is just crazy. And God's saying, you need to wait. I've got more people I want to save. I've got more work that I need to do. You've got more work you need to do. So I'm going to give you four things today um, talking about the waiting room. Number one, the, it is the game isn't over until God's final horn blows. As I told you, there's going to be a trumpet sound. That's what we're waiting for right now. Some people don't believe in the rapture. That's fine. But I truly believe we're getting ready to hear that horn blow. Uh, I, every day at the paper mill, I think around noon, they blow a horn for the, the lunch break or, or whatever that is. And I hear that thing go off and up there. It's a siren. And I'm like, Lord, I'm ready to hear your siren. I'm ready to hear your trumpet because I'm ready to go home. But in verses 1 and 2, we're told not to look at the worldly success of evil people who are in charge and become angry and bitter. We're not to do that because God is working on our behalf. And he tells us two times in this passage, don't fret. My version says, do not be agitated. You know, that's what that's in your washing machine. That's an agitator in the middle that's meant to mix up the suds and the soap and clean your clothes and rub the dirt off. And God says, don't let the evilness that you see in this world agitate you. Don't focus on that. Don't focus on people that you think shouldn't be uh, having great success that look all wealthy and healthy and all these things and they're doing evil stuff to get that wealth that we're seeing constantly. With all the crooks, liars, and thieves we have up in Washington, it's frustrating that they're making all these choices that have nothing to do with the Bible. They're not following God, and it's frustrating. But the Lord says, I'm coming soon. That's what he said. His last words in the book of Revelation, he says, I'm coming soon. And what that means is when he's coming soon, he's bringing judgment with him. And if we could see a peek into hell, if we could see a peek into his judgment, his wrath, we wouldn't want that on anybody. Our evangelism would be greater because we'd want to tell people. So those not living for the Lord and everything's going their way, they better enjoy it right now. And this is a, not a popular thing to say, but Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed on us to die one time. There's no reincarnation. And then the judgment. What does the judgment look like for the person that's trusted Jesus Christ? That's the Bema Seat judgment. And what that judgment is, it's really not a judgment. It's a award ceremony where you go before the Lord and he says, because of your faithfulness, these are the rewards that you get. Here's some of the rewards you missed because, and he explains how your life was to you. Your sins have already been paid for on the cross, so you won't be judged for that up in heaven. Now, the great white throne judgment found in the book of Revelation is for those that have never trusted Jesus Christ, and that's the eternal punishment. That's where they're going to end up in the lake of fire forever because they didn't believe in God. They didn't want anything to do with God. You want to make sure you go to the right judgment. You want to make sure that you go to the right room because there's no coming back. There's no talking your way out of it. There's no begging Jesus once you get up there in heaven because it's already been settled when you take your last breath, what you've done. Again, people don't like to hear that judgment's coming, but it's, it's a trap door that's sitting right there. Any second, any minute... Any day, people fall into that judgment. And it's sad. There's so much uh, church online. There's so many things on the radio. There's so many things that you can get the gospel. You know, God says if you will seek him, he'll, he'll find you and he'll draw near to you. There's, there's every opportunity. There's not going to be anybody that's going to have an excuse. And he says in verse 2, what happens to those that are prospering right now that don't want anything to do, he says, for the wither quickly like grass and will tender like tender plants. And I think about college sports. You know, we, you don't judge a game by the scoreboard because how many basketball games, football games have we seen when you sit there? I, I think about that Georgia Alabama game a couple of years ago when Georgia was whipping Alabama. And I thought, 
this is pretty interesting. I know a lot of Alabama fans didn't like that. And all of a sudden, Saban pulls in this rookie quarterback from Hawaii or Tua, and the game totally changes. I mean, absolutely, you, you see it's going to end this way, and then it all of a sudden changes. And coaches will say, don't become discouraged. No matter what the score says, the game's not over till the final whistle blows. And that's what the Lord is telling us. He says, that's good advice for us, that those that belong to the Lord, we win in the end. So quit looking at the scoreboard of the world and keep your eyes focused on him. Don't judge the game of your life before that final horn blows. Maybe you've messed up. Maybe you're in a bad spot right now. That can all turn around. All those things can turn around before it's over. The second thing is God has a plan even though we can't figure it out. And if we could, he wouldn't be God. I don't want to be as smart as God because I don't have to deal with all the stuff that he has to deal with on a daily basis. In verse 3, the very first word is trust. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Trust means to be secure. It speaks of a refuge, and the Lord is worthy of our trust. Trusting God, it, here's an example of how you can trust God. What has he been doing? You know, I look back this, this, just this past year at all the things. You know, he's done many things in my life, in our family's life. But just this past year, how he's carried us through looking back. I've gone through some horrible stuff. But there's so many other good stuff that I'm seeing him do in our lives, in our family, in our friends, in our church, um, in my daughter's friends, you know, that are coming up. We, we go around town and people go, hey, you're Madison's mom, you're Madison's dad. And they know the story of Madison, you know, and it's, it's a beautiful thing. So don't focus on all the negative stuff. Look at what he's doing, the blessings of all the things that he's been doing in the past and what he's going to do in the future. And that'll help you. Because the disciples didn't understand God's plan. The disciples thought that Jesus would reveal himself as Lord, that he would overthrow Herod, this false temple system, and the Roman emperor, and then he would set up his kingdom. That's what they thought was going to happen. All of a sudden, he's hanging on a cross. I'm like, hey, that, that's not part of the plan. Remember, a couple of them were arguing, hey, mom came up and wanted to talk to you about, can we have a bigger spot in heaven? Can we, can we sit at your right hand? And Jesus says, you don't understand the plan. You've got a lot of work to do. So he's, the king is hanging on an emperor's cross. They're not sure what's going on. They don't understand the plan. See, they're in the waiting room at this time. And he is in the grave for three days. In the tomb. He comes out. Tells them to meet. They meet. And in Acts Chapter 1, verses 6 and 8, the disciples wanted to know, are you ready to set up your kingdom? They still didn't understand the plan. And Jesus wanted to know the times or the seasons. God's plan included everyone. He was on that cross that's saved. He knew you were going to be saved. He knew how you were going to be saved. And the disciples were concerned about their, themselves and their place in the kingdom, but Jesus was concerned about saving the multitudes. And if you look around the world today, you're going to shake your head and say, what in the world is this plan? <laughs> it doesn't look very good, God. The, the torture that's going on of Christians in different places of the world, the, the torture of people in China, um, the, the just horribleness of what's going on human rights-wise around the world in Africa, the sex trafficking that is so big and massive here in the United States, it's, where is that in your plan? Where are you working good out of that? We can't see that, but he is. He is. God knows what he's doing. He has a plan, and he's not anxious about it. Nothing's surprising him about what's going on. You know, in South Georgia, before I had my motorcycle accident, we played a lot of golf with a friend. And his name's Buzz Register. And Buzz is a big old country boy. He, he played football at Florida State. And he's just, he sells, he's got a mobile home company. He sells mobile homes. And he's just a, a funny, funny guy. A guy came in one day, the tornado had come through. When we, where we were, when hurricanes came, they kicked off into tornadoes. And that kicked his business up because, you know, people's homes got damaged. And this one guy and his wife came in, and they said, what kind of winds will this mobile home take? And he says, well, I've seen it going down the highway at 70 miles an hour, so he says, I know it'll take at least 70. He was just a funny, funny guy. Another time we were on the golf course, and 
he was hitting up onto the green, and there was two ladies up there. And I said, Buzz, don't hit. You're going to hit them. He says, no, I don't think I'm going to hit that far. Well, he hits the ball. It bounces and hits one of them in the leg. And I'm standing there. He drops his golf club, and I've got mine in my hand. And they're looking at me, and they just start yelling at me. Well, this one course that we played at, I had a tendency to my ball. I don't know what you call it. I'm not that good. But it kind of goes to the right. So if I'm trying to hit down this way, I would almost turn like this so the ball would go this way. And one day I hit into the woods and I was out of good golf balls because I'd hit so many out that day. And I'm like, I'm finding this one. I'm mad. So I go running into these bushes and all of a sudden it's like something grabbed me that had thorns and briars all over. It. And it just instantly just wrapped around me like barbed wire. And he comes up and he says, don't move, preacher or a crystal and I said why he says you're in a wait a minute bush I said a wait a minute bush he says if you don't wait a minute till I help you you're going to be cut to pieces he says that's what we call that bush down here it had all these sharp briars and thorns on it and if the more you pulled the deeper those things went in so he was taking golf clubs and he was trying to open that thing up I still got scratched to death like I was in a cat fight But we have to wait. We have to wait. What are you waiting for right now? Are you waiting for a relationship to be fixed? Are you waiting for a doctor's report? Are you waiting for a job? Are you waiting for something in your life? Be patient. Trust his plan. Our part in this is just to wait. Don't jerk around in God's plan because it might be one of those wait-a-minute bushes that you could really hurt yourself in. He hasn't forgot you. His plan includes using the Holy Spirit through you to make you strong enough to withstand anything that you go through. Sometimes we can't see it. I don't under, you know, um, I was talking to someone the other day and they were talking about cancer and they didn't know about Madison. And they said, I don't understand how there's so much cancer in these children. And they started telling me about some other kids that were sick with cancer. And I said, you know, it's funny that you bring that up. My daughter's struggling with this right now. And I said, she's winning, and she's going to win. I said, but I don't understand what happened to her. Why didn't it happen to me instead of my child? God's plan is for that. He's going to bring his glory out of all this. He's doing it now. She's going to have a testimony that glorifies him. She's, she isn't worried about it. She knows who's in control. And she even posted the other day, she goes, this isn't what I wanted or expected, but I see him in everything. I see what he's doing. You can trust on God. You can make it through these things. He tells us in verse 3 to dwell or feed off the land. He wants us to be fed by the blessings provided rather than seeking something else. If we become frustrated and angry while we're in the waiting room, we're going to miss out on things. We're going to miss out on seeing him work. The next thing is love what you have in order to get what you need. You know, in verse 4, that beautiful word, we quote this verse all the time. Delight. Delight yourself, he says. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you your heart's desires. A lot of times that's misinterpreted, that I can ask God for anything. What he's saying, he says, delight yourself in the Lord, and our will, my will for you, and you, you doing it will line up perfectly. You know, the ideal of delighting is, is when you have a baby or someone, you have a grandbaby, some of y'all, and you take that baby and you can't take your eyes off that baby. You're delighting in it. That's the picture here. Instead of looking at the world, the psalmist is saying, when things don't add up by your math, delight in the Lord. Let him be your focus. When we see his heart, his will becomes our will. When we do that, we get what we need most what he desires for us. God has so many things he desires for us, but he's just waiting for us to get into that place where he can bless you, where he can do things through you. To have him first in your life, more than anything else, the most important thing, you'll receive that that blessing. We used to spend a lot of time when we first had Madison, my dad and mom, that was the first granddaughter. And they would come up, Alice and them would come up, and Chuck E. Cheese was a hot place for us. We spent a lot of time and money, or my parents did, because it was the first granddaughter. So we ate Chuck E. Cheese probably two or three times a week. And you know what happens when you play the games? You get tickets to redeem and buy a gift. And I remember taking Madison up there to the counter one time, 
and she's looking around, and there's just so much stuff, and she's just a little kid, and she's got this handful of tickets, and she's like, Dad, what can I get? What should I get? I said, I don't know. Pick anything you want, and she says, no. You choose for me. I said, okay, I know you like stuff here, so we got this little trinket thing that broke in a day, but she took it home. She was so proud of it, and I never heard her say, Daddy, I wish later on you'd have got me something else. I never heard her say that. God wants you to love him so much that you'll say, Dad, choose for me. Take care of me. And I'll never second guess that. Like I said, some people confuse this passage and they think it means we can demand anything we want. That's what they call the prosperity gospel, that you can do these things. And actually, it's the opposite of thinking. When I love him more than anything else or anyone else, my heart's desire is connected to him. Last thing here is keep on waiting. This is important without whining. <laughs> keep on waiting without whining. Resting without wrestling and serving without stressing. That word in verse 7 says this. It says, be silent before the Lord and wait patiently. Some of your versions say commit. Wait expectantly is what he wants us to do. That's that word meekness again. You're surrendering. You're not surrendering to the world. You're surrendering to the Lord. And some people think meekness is weakness. It's not. It's power, strength, under control. And God says, when you do this, you're trusting me. You're showing that you trust me. You know, you think about the story of Mary and Martha. Martha's busy in the kitchen. She's doing all the work. And where's Mary? Mary's sitting there at Jesus' feet. And the more Martha passes her, the more she gets upset. And finally she explodes. And she says, Jesus, we got a problem. Jesus says, what's that? She didn't do nothing. I'm busting my tail here. I'm doing everything. And she's just sitting there. She knows I need help. She knows that we need to eat. We, we need to do all these things. And Jesus says this. He says, Mary has chosen the better things. He wasn't saying that Martha was wrong at working. He was saying that Mary was doing his will. He was, she was doing at that moment what God wanted her to do. And the problem is, is Martha wasn't serving for the right reason. If she would have been, that wouldn't have been bothering her. She could have said, Lord, I want to feed you, but I also want to hear you. And what do you think Jesus would have said? Sit down, we'll eat later. We'll take care of the food later. Sit down. He wants you to commit to him all that you do, serve him, and never be jealous of anyone who's getting more attention. We, we struggle with that today. If you do that, God's promises will bring good things on those that wait on him. So here's the four things that we do uh, if we want to survive that waiting room. Number one, remember the game's not over till God's final horn blows. Second, realize that God has a plan even when you can't see it. Third, love what you have in Jesus and you'll get exactly what you need. You'll be satisfied. You'll be content, Paul calls it. And then finally, don't fret. Everybody say, don't fret. Okay, don't fret. Don't whine, but wait. Because he's doing something. Don't wrestle with him and don't stress out. Don't get caught in that wait a minute bush. It's no fun. He's got you in his hand. He promises never to leave you or forsake you. He says, I'm coming back soon. And you won't believe what I got ready for you. Let's all stand. As Ms. Phaedra comes up here, maybe you need to join the church. The Lord's telling you this is the place for you. This is a great place to, to come. Is it perfect? Nope. But we got lots of stuff for you to do. If you want to join the church, come on down. Maybe the Lord's telling you you need to wait and you don't understand. Let him work through it. Ask him to give you the patience. Ask him to give you the power to survive what you need to survive through. Maybe life's good. Thank you. Thank him. Be grateful. Praise him for what he's doing in your life. Father, thank you for the privilege of teaching your word. Again, help us not to fret as we see evil prosper. Help us focus on you. Help us to del delight in you. Help us when we worship 
to understand that that's an encounter with you. And we have that privilege every day. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Staff will be down front if you need any help with anything.